Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. My name is Ethan, and today we're going to be reacting to part 4 of Extra History's Japanese Militarism. This episode is called Government by Assassination, which seems pretty fitting considering the rest of the episodes we've watched. So I'm excited to get into this one, uh, so let's get into it. Manchuria, September 19th, Back 19th in Manchuria. 11.48 a.m. Tatat, -ta -ta -ta. The sake is good. The hotel is comfortable. The geisha is dancing. General Tatakawa nice. <laughs> is enjoying himself. Who knew this last-minute assignment to Manchuria would be so relaxing? He's having a good time. Yesterday, They're his jamming. bosses in the army ministry had found out something was afoot in Manchuria. A plot by insubordinate members of the Kwantung army to start a war with China. So yes. Tatakawa had been rushed from Tokyo to Kwantung army headquarters in order to quash it. But when he got there, he told the leaders that his message from Tokyo could wait until tomorrow. After all, Tatakawa himself thought a war with China might not be so bad. And this is what I was saying in the last episode. You know, there's often a question of, did this senior leadership know about, you know, these junior officers acting on their own initiative? And did they plan it? I don't think the senior officers planned it. But the thing is, as is pointed out here, a lot of the, you know high-ranking leadership agreed with the junior officers that we should get into a war with China, we should invade, we should expand. So given the opportunity to clamp down on insubordination, they might, you know, give it another day, give it some time, or not even do it at all. Because, you know, the actions of these insubordinate officers are serving the purposes of these higher-ranking leaders. Hey, could anyone recommend a good hotel? <laughs> so he passed out drinking last night and carried on partying this morning. Working the hard. The dances, the shamanson plays. The music nearly covers the sound of gunfire. The sound oh. he's pretending he can't hear. Uh oh. What an introduction. <laughs> This episode of Extra History is brought to you by all of our wonderful patrons over on Patreon. Thanks so much for your support. Check out my Patreon Japan's in the description. The civilian <laughs> government didn't take the Kwantung Army's invasion of Manchuria lying down. In truth, it was more like gradually reclining. Yeah. The Prime Minister learned about the troop movements from the newspapers. He didn't know what to tell the ambassadors when they called, and the Kwantung... See, and that is also not great. If you're the head of a civilian government, and you learn about your own troop movements through the newspaper... Your government's on the out. You know, sort of one of the key points about our modern democratic governments is that we have civilian control of the military. This is sort of the way that we keep from the military just controlling everything because they have all the force and the power. If you're in this situation, then your government is at the very least struggling. A at the very worst, about to crumble or be taken over by the military. <laughs> the army was not responding to his messages, telling them to stop and asking for <laughs> updates. And who ordered this anyway? He definitely wasn't going to tell the foreign leaders he couldn't control his own military. He contacted one of the grand men of state, the last of the oligarchs, to try to get him to lobby someone, perhaps the emperor. No response. But this undeclared war was getting bigger. China had 200,000 troops in Manchuria, and the Kwantung wow. army was no match for that. So within days, generals ordered Japanese reinforcements in Korea to cross into Manchuria. Of course. Soon the government assembled now it to more troops from Japan itself. And there was another problem. The public loved it. Yep. War fever entered full swing. People started wearing kimono liners printed with tanks and fighter aircraft and flocked to cinemas to see newsreels of the combat. As far as the public was concerned, Japan was finally taking an active hand. The public love a good nationalistic war, unless you start losing. But if it's going well, I mean, the public love it. So as a civilian leader who opposes the war... You're going to have a very hard time uh, stopping this thing, you know? It's got the backing of the military. The military is just going through with it without your approval. And perhaps even worse, it's got the support of the general public. Uh, so if you try and stop this thing, you're going to be supremely unpopular in the eyes of the people. After all, a lot of Japanese soldiers had died in World War I and the Russo-Japanese War to gain possessions in Manchuria, yeah. making it to them a graveyard of heroes. Further propaganda, much of it laid by the military, positioned Manchuria's natural resources as necessary to Japan's economy, though modern scholarship has suggested this was never the case. After all, who do you think was making all those newsreels everyone was watching? Yeah. Yep, the army. 
anyone who stood against the war was punished. Newspapers that criticized the Kwantung army were subject to low sales or boycotts, politicians took note, and felt like they could do nothing. But it wasn't just public opinion they were afraid of. In October of 1931, less than a month into the war, young officers informed their superiors that members of the Cherry Blossom Society had concocted another plot to overthrow the government. They would take command of a group of aircraft and bomb the prime minister's cabinet meeting, uh -oh. decapitating the civilian government. Then, a troop uprising would capture government buildings, and they'd force the emperor, at gunpoint if necessary, to take power. Generals arrested the plotters and gave their ringleader the harsh punishment of 20 days house arrest. <laughs> yeah, many other officers got 10 days, while some were merely tricked. It was mostly kept quiet and treated like an internal matter, uh. which is not a big deterrent, right? No. Well, that was part of the problem. As we discussed last episode, there was a hesitation to punish these types of actions, partially because this was just a more extreme version of the nationalist message the government itself pushed, but also because these acts were seen as gaikokujo, a sort of patriotic insubordination, an idea that when things are wrong in Japan, idealistic men will sometimes do rash, rebellious, and self-sacrificial things to try to put things right, you know, like murder a politician or invade a country. And that while these actions were not exactly kosher, they still should be admired. Now at one time, historians tried to explain this reactionary violence and the public excusing it entirely through the lens of Japanese culture. But there are other factors. For example, Japan's public education system, where most students dropped off after sixth grade and even more after eighth. Only a few fully graduated and even fewer went to college. Meaning in the troubled 1920s and 30s, most of the public lacked the tools to understand the complicated web of political, diplomatic, and economic forces now shaping their lives. And Yeah, but, I mean, let's be fair, like, what public anywhere can understand, like, complex political machinations? To be honest, uh, you know, I, I feel like you could go to any public on planet Earth, and most people have trouble understanding, you know, things this complex. And in the absence of that understanding, many people turned to conspiracy theories to explain their world and supported extreme, often violent solutions to fix it. February 19th. And you also see similar things in a lot of other countries at the time. Like Germany is a great example. I mean, there's a ton of popular right wing uh, and left wing violence at the time. And then, you know, you see the government's reaction mirrored uh, in Germany as well. I mean, the German government was always, uh, you know, strong to crack down on left-wing violence, but the civilian government, which was sort of overshadowed by the military and a lot of conservative elements, would not step in to curtail right-wing violence unless they absolutely had to. So, you know, I mean, sure, there's partially Japanese cultural references at play, but a lot of this, a lot of these elements were also at play in many different countries during the 20s and 30s. 1932, Tokyo. This is their motto. One man, oh my one God. kill. Lay preacher Nisho Inoue teaches an unusual creed. Combining Buddhist thought with Japanese nationalism, he urges the complete what overthrow combo. of the modern political and economic order. As a young man, he drifted until ending up in Manchuria, working on the railroad and as a paid informant for the military. Mm -hmm. There, he says he had mystical experiences, telling him that Japan must be renewed. He's drawn up a list of 20 names. Liberal politicians, moderates, heads of corporations, and 20 volunteers, some civilian radicals, others naval officers, uh -oh. <laughs> come forward to receive their assignments, along with the gift of a Browning automatic pistol. They take a blood oath to fulfill their duty, which is why the press will come to call them the League of Blood. February 9th, a former finance minister and major player in the liberal Minzato party steps out of his car to give a speech at a school. A League member guns him down. Ooh. March 5th. The director general of Mitsui Bank is walking into the building when a League member draws a pistol and murders him. After their arrests, neither assassin is quiet about who directed them, and Nishio Inoue turns himself into a Tokyo police station six days later. But despite his imprisonment, naval officers associated with the group are planning something even bigger. May 15th. In his residence, Prime Minister Inokai Chuyashi is worried. His predecessor had to resign over a failure to control the military, and though the emperor ordered him to restrain the militarists, nothing Inokai says seems to stop them. Plus, in January, the military had attacked Shanghai, China's largest city, <laughs> over a deeply Yeah, he has no pretext. control. And when he tried to negotiate a solution with the Chinese, he'd gotten called a traitor for it. 
Now the Kwantung army had declared a new Japanese puppet state in Manchuria, Manchuko, and invited mm. the deposed Chinese emperor to rule it. Inokai refused to recognize its legitimacy. Suddenly, outside the door, there's a scuffle. Shouts. Eleven naval officers uh -oh. enter. They're young, no more than twenty, and carrying pistols. If we could just talk, Inokai says, I could make you understand. The leader raises his gun. Dialogue is useless. They open fire. <laughs> Like Inoue's League wow. of Blood Assassins, they're so caught immediately. Cool. <laughs> but that's the plan, because both groups will use their own trials as propaganda. It's a media circus. When the judge tries to decide the case against Inoue and his two assassins based on facts, they whip up a publicity campaign, of course. saying he's secretly a communist sympathizer <laughs> with anti-Japanese views. Badgered in the press and mentally exhausted, the judge declares himself unfit and gives up the case. The new judge, a right-wing admirer of Inoue, lets him use the trial as a platform to spread his message to all of Japan. He allows Buddhist clergy allied with Inoue to testify that his actions with the League of Blood were spiritually pure and patriotic. At sentencing, the judge publicly states that he regrets having to give them life in prison and suggests the emperor might give them amnesty. The trial wow. of Inukai's assassins is... What a... what a judgment. What a thing to say as a judge. You know, you're like, yeah, so I regret my uh, my sentencing. You know, hopefully the leader of my country can revoke it. What a thing to say uh, during sentencing. You know, I regret <laughs> having to give these criminals life in prison. Hopefully the leader of my country can commute the sentence. You know, that's not a great thing for a judge to say after making a decision. Even more fevered. 110,000 people write or sign letters in their own blood saying the defendants should be released. Nine young men offer to die instead of the plotters and show their commitment wow. by sending their severed little fingers to the court. Oh my the judge, God. intimidated by what happened at the League of Blood trial, lets the killers expound on their motives. Comments the newspapers then print and disseminate verbatim without comment. In military courts, the officers are charged not with murder, but rebellion. Defense attorneys argue that loyalty to the emperor is the basis of the law, and given their pure motives, to punish them harshly would undermine the emperor and Japanese spirit. A Navy prosecutor isn't buying it. He goes after them hard, argues for the death penalty. Uh -oh. After all, he says, motives shouldn't matter. Murder is murder. You're in trouble, and if my the friend. Court doesn't punish these men. It will only encourage more political violence. And he was right. Because the naval courts didn't listen, it gave the assassins only 15 years in prison, and the prosecutor, by contrast, was forced under public pressure to resign from the Navy. Of course he was. It was, as one British reporter said, a case of government by assassination. And it wasn't over, not by a long shot. You know, one of the main reasons... Wow, okay. So, uh, you know, we're continuing along in the series. This is episode four of five. Uh, we haven't gotten as far as I expected, to be honest. You know, I thought we might go more into the 1940s and World War II, but considering where we are right now, I can't imagine that we're going to move too much further in the final episode. Uh, regardless, this has been an interesting one, a good episode. Uh, if you guys enjoyed this one, please like the video and, and uh, subscribe to the channel. And if you have suggestions for other history videos or other kinds of videos I should watch, leave a comment down below. I uh, hope you guys are enjoying the series. We've got one more episode to go, so please tune in for that. And I will see you guys again next time. Goodbye, and have a good day.